and we are live. All right. Hey, everybody, this is podcast number 18 for the TFC season. We're going to have 20 all together. Uh, the next podcast will be Jonas Dodu from the University of Loughborough. Uh, or do they call it Lowborough? I can't remember now. But anyway, from England, um, six hour time difference. So that'll be interesting. It's at 10 o'clock on Wednesday. So today we have Justin Kinseth from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, a Division Three school with a tremendous track program. So Justin, would you like to uh, tell us a little bit about your background? I don't even know where you went to, to high school. Yeah, you know, so first I want to plug this in. So Jonas is, is at Loughborough, correct? Yes. Um, we actually have one of our national champ long jumpers, one of our women, Lauren Wrench, is actually overseas right now. I messaged him today about her and yeah. he did not know she was there. Yeah. He said that there was, you know, so much COVID separation going on and stuff in this last year, but yeah. he's on it hard because I mean, he wanted to know exactly how far she long jumped. You know, I said 20, 19, 11, I think ran 56 in the 400, didn't she? Yeah. She was a gymnast in high school. She just went out for track. I mean, talk about diamond in the rough. You know, half of my battle was just making sure she stayed healthy. Um, she went 20 plus feet. She won, she won D3 outdoors, jumped like 6'10, I believe. And then she jumped 6'10 again. So that 20 feet, you know, low range, mid range. And yeah, now she's over in England. And it's it's so unfortunate to see, you know, how COVID's just been terrorizing everyone. Um, she has way more potential. I mean, she's just getting started. So he he should have a lot of fun with watching her grow it's crazy so yeah he's on it now so yeah. that, that's that's a that's a real cool thing that you know the last two uh people we have podcasts with have this weird connection yeah it's unreal um you know and well i guess to, to kind of get a basis so believe it or not i'm actually from iowa originally so i went to independence high school about an hour straight west of dubuque so small small town kid uh you know five six thousand people in our in our town and um you know for me you know, I was a multi-sport athlete in high school. You know, I was basketball, you know, football, uh, you know, golf, soccer. I mean, you name it, they have it. You know, I'm going to go out there and compete and, and, uh, and have an experience. Um, guys, I, I would be shocked, you know, or I would tell you I'd be shocked at 18 years old if I was going to end up being uh, a college track coach. You know, I was, you know, football or, or bust. You know, that was, you know, how our, our lens was in, in high school. I mean, if you know, you were, you were a track football guy, you know, football was king. And then you'd go out for track or they'd say, at least go out for, you know, soccer or something like that. Cause in the, in Iowa, soccer's in the spring. So um, it's, it's weird to, to see my development grow and, and, and track was something I never really thought that I would, you know, put that much investment into because it was more just there to get ready for football. If you wanted it. Um, I actually ended up going to Wartburg college uh, in Waverly, Iowa and I was playing football there. So I ended up uh, playing there initially and I had a, a pretty rough injury. I ended up breaking my ankle. I had two ankle breaks actually within like a two year time, but my, my second one in college ended up getting a plate, six screws in, uh, ended up getting staph infection in that, um, in that break as well. So that kicked me out for a while. And I kind of had this, this, this premise, I think when I was in, in college, um, that if, you know, I'm going to go all in on football and we'll, and we'll see what happens. But I think by the time that that break came through and then I was kind of sitting there, figuring out what my next steps were. Um, I think I grew up playing football, but I ended up growing out of it. Uh, I think by that point, you know, you're, you're 19, 20 years old, you're trying to figure out that next step. Um, and ironically, um, track became an opportunity. Um, and it was going into being a multi-level guy, you know, being a decathlete, you know, I never heard of that. Um, it was also pole vault became college uh, in a, a college event for us because in Iowa, we don't have pole vault. We don't have pole vault. We don't have triple jump. Um, we have the 400 hurdles. Um, you know, we got the shuttle hurdle relay. We just like to be, you know, I guess we're just different over there, man. I can't tell you why we do all that. Um, but yeah, you know, it was, it was a fun transition for me to go into track and field in college. Um, fell in love with it. You know, there's no politics in it. There's no depth chart. At the end of the day, you, you get out of it what you put into it. Um, but you know what was really interesting? I loved what you said because it's so similar to my experience in track and field that, that your initial experiences in track and field was it was a m miserable, uh, tedious, 
awful sport that it was just something to go out and like stay in shape, what in the hell that means. Yeah. And, and that was my experience too. I, I middle school, high school and college track. And I was miserable most of the time. So yeah. how are we coaching it? I, you know, it's funny. My, my mom is a middle school track coach. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's funny to see the, the process, I think, of, of development for me as not only an, a track athlete, but a track coach too. Um, it was, it was, it was almost that baptism by fire in high school where, you know, your high school coaches, you know, primarily a lot of the times high schools like to hire the distance coach because then they can reach a broad spectrum of cross country, track and field. Everybody's going to be running your, your, your 10 to 15, 200s. You're going to get in shape and build a base. And um, if you're a football guy, that sounds terrible. Why would you want to even you know, go into that, into that realm, you know, you're going to want to lift weights. You're going to, you're going to care more about the measurables of how strong you are. And so when you, when you had a, a high school experience where you're just running and running and running um, and there never felt like there was uh, no pun intended, but an end zone to that, it was just get tough, get in shape. And then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of throw you in a field event here or there, even though like, you know, for me, a small town kid, there wasn't very much, you know, opportunity to, to have a, a structured hurdles, jumps, you know, high jump, long jump, you know, types of sessions. So it was just kind of like, Hey, go out there and try it. Um, you know, of course those high school coaches, they do the best that they can, you know, you're, you're trying to also, you know, just, you know, herd a bunch of cats and, uh, and make sure that, you know, you're trying to keep everybody, you know, you know, straight lined. And like you talk about, have that hour of, of babysitting, if you will, uh, but give them something to do. So, um, it was, it was interesting when I came up here uh, to, to Benedictine and became the, the recruiting coordinator and jumps coach. Uh, and that's where I met you guys. Um, and, and you completely, you know, flipped my world upside down. It made sense. It was, it was just so logical to see track and field as uh, a fast, high intention, high intensity sport that is actually just flat out fun. You can get these football guys, these just you know, athletes in general, multiple sport athletes, or even just those that are strictly track and field. It's just more fun. You get to go out and you get to have fun. And it just, there's more measurable to it. So, sorry, I didn't want to jump the gun on going, you know, extra years later, but that's kind of how it was for me from that high school to then Wartburg and then not seeing what it was like, um, you know, until I met you guys. And it just was like, wow, this, this makes sense. First time ever track and field makes sense, at least in my, my humble opinion. Yeah. When did, when did you run at Wartburg? What years? Uh, I was 2009 to 13, took the okay. fancy fifth year. Yeah. So you so, missed Russell Harris? No, Russell, I know Russell. Yeah. And um, he was two years older than me. So okay. he did a little multi-action, amazing hurdler. Uh, Torrance was a year younger than me. So yeah, I remember those knuckleheads. They're great guys. Russell is uh, one of my very first clients after I left Hinsdale Central. Uh and I just had a squat rack in my garage and uh, I had a couple of kids from LT and Russell was one of them. And Russell was like a family member. I mean, he <laughs> here three times a week uh, yeah. and when my kids were really little. And so, yeah, I still, I still talk to him. I mean, he's doing very, very well. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's president someday, but. Yeah. He's, uh, uh, when, so when he was in college, when we were both in college, obviously, the first time I ever actually saw pole vault. So mind you, I've never even heard of pole vault, you know, in, in high school. I didn't know what it was. I remember watching, cause this was when Russ was trying to do a little bit of multi-action for us. Um, I watched him clear like 10, six. And I thought that was the craziest thing that I've ever seen. Like no clue what vault was. It's just, that's my, that's my, the most fun story I have of Russell is watching him vault like 10, six. And I'm like, how did you just do that? But it was, it was so funny. Just what you, what you don't know and growing with that. It was, it was an awesome experience. You know, coach Newsom's a great guy. I understand why Iowa, why a state may say no to the vault. You know I mean? Being upside down at 16 feet, you know, and, and the cost and man, you should have a dedicated coach and not many schools have that. I've never had a dedicated pole vault coach. So <laughs> you're so open to liability. But the triple jump is not dangerous and is maybe the most beautiful, the most athletic event of all track and field. Yes, it's so graceful when you watch like a legit triple jumper go out there and it doesn't even look like physics apply when, when you see somebody go, you know, 48, 50 plus feet, you know, for, for, uh, for the men. Uh, 
paint them board down. Like the runway is already there. Like I never understood that. It put the board down, tape it down, triple jump, teach them. Like it's it's crazy that we don't have it in Iowa. It makes zero sense. They don't have it in Indiana either. You're right. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's it's everywhere. I mean, it's is oh, Michigan like that too? Does Michigan not have triple jump? I can't remember. I can't remember. I think I, you know, I took a team to Alabama once and got, we got to throw the, the uh, javelin. Yeah. So there actually is javelin in some schools. Yeah. And I'm sure the javelin is, is less dangerous than the discus. They rubber tip javelins in high school too, you know, yeah. and you can't really get away from one in javelin. I mean, it's a pretty, it's overhand throw. It's relatively in this sector, but yeah, you would imagine discus is, is far scarier putting the, you know, big heavy metal frisbee in some kid's hand and if there's no net and just tell them to spin around and chuck it uh well you know you do that every time that you you go into teaching a beginner and then you send your worst athletes out there to shag <laughs> and they're like talking to each other yeah and i mean i have seen kids hit two or three times in my career oh yeah i can imagine it is it's weird that javelin is not an event that you can you can definitely teach um I think Missouri has it. That's probably the closest in this area. I think Missouri has jab, but I could be wrong. But yeah, it's unreal to see that. But um, yeah, I mean, I could keep going here. You know, after Wartburg, um, I was, uh, Missouri does have jab one, good. Um, after Wartburg, uh, I went to be a graduate assistant at Cardinal Stritch University. So uh, NAIA school in, in Northern Milwaukee area, you know, right across the street from Nicolay High School. So um, it was their first year having a track program. So I really got to learn the, the nuts and bolts on recruiting and going out there and not only trying to, you know, pitch, you know, the, the recruiting, you know, the, the, the track and field option at stretch, I had to like explain to, to high school kids where that even was and that we actually had a track team. So, uh, you know, talk about really learning, you know, humble beginnings on the recruiting side of things. Um, well, everyone uh, knows Nicolay because when you're driving through on 9094, you go right by Nicolay on the, Yep. I state. So Coventry apartments is across the street and so stretch. And that's where, that's where I began the, the GA work. So, yeah. Um, you know, it was, it was a fun experience. It, it gave me a chance to connect with coaches. Um, and of course that then allowed me to go into Benedictine uh, Kevin Patterson got the head coaching job there. And uh, we knew each other relatively from the conference because stretch and, and Calumet college of St. Joe's was, was in the same conference. Um, he was looking to, you know, start up a, a culture and brand down at Ben U and awesome, awesome experience to work with him, you know, and, uh, we had, we had a lot of fun, you know, building a, a fun program there at Benedictine and, uh, they, man, we, there, there's so many kids, you throw a rock across the street and hit, you know, a high school with, you know, five high schools with 4,000 kids. It's unbelievable. So, um, you can really find a lot of those diamond in the rough athletes, um, developmental style athletes. And that's what I love about you know, being at a div division three institution, you know, you want to talk about, you know, developing an athlete and watching that progression grow. Um, that's a division where you really get to see some great coaching. Uh, you know, maybe I'm just being biased there, but you know, all in all, it's fun to see that, you know, very few times do, does the division three school get the, the state champ that's, you know, high level within their state and, and country. You know, we get the kids that, you know, maybe only ran track coming out their sophomore, junior year. Uh, or you see that kid that just, Puberty just hasn't caught up yet, but, uh, you know, you, you kind of get an eyeball on, you know, who you think can really have a, a lot of potential. And that's where we really started to grow at Benedictine. So, um, you know, long story short, we, we ended up getting fourth as a team, uh, had, you know, 25 foot long jumpers. We had a, a four by one run 40, 40. Um, we had a, a triple jumper out of Hillcrest Luther, uh, 52, six as a freshman, uh, for me that you'll know, get that kid on the bus on Saturday I didn't have to do much there um, you know but it was just fun. it was a fun experience there and, and that got me the chance to then come up to Oshkosh and uh, 2018 is when I got started up here and um, brought the same feed the cats mentality you know keep the keep the dosage you know in the right spot and, and keep these kids having fun um, that is by far the number one driver I think that's helped me not only with recruiting but we come to practice feeling excited to tackle, you know, even, even the lactic day that we put in, you know, once a week, we, we tackle it because it's, it, we, we almost cherish it more because we only do it once a week. It preps us and gets us ready to go. 
Um, and on the other day, we're either taking the day off, get a little lift in here or there, go to our field event, or, you know, we're doing either wickets or flies, you know, the, the free laps of God send up here for us as well. But, um, you know, that allowed us to, to have a, a fun brand build experience up here at Oshkosh. And we, uh, we went, you know, I started here in 2018. Um, you know, a year later, we ended up getting fourth as a team at nationals in 2019. And uh, just this past indoor season before COVID, you know, took us out here, we were number one in the country, four out of the seven weeks indoors for the men. Um, you know, the women's team, I mean, I'm blessed to be up here in, in uh, you know, the Wisconsin Athletic Conference. Shoot, I mean, all these teams are just so dang good. It's a fun conference to be around. So um, you get you get a little bit of nationally ranked, you know, team camaraderie built there and it just takes off. It's It's been a fun experience so far. So, yeah. Well, you, you sure can recruit because you find diamonds <laughs> in the rough everywhere. And, you know, kids from Larkin High School that – didn't qualify for state or different things happen all of a sudden they're running ridiculous times for you and then even more so when you change schools the number of kids that went with you up to Oshkosh and left Benedictine so that you know it says to me it says a lot I mean that was and, and I knew some of the kids that went with you and I had conversations with them uh, about when they were making that move so you know, congratulations. So that kind of leads me to my first question. Um, so you've had a lot of success wherever you've went and you're a feed the cats guy and most college coaches aren't. Nope. So how, <laughs> how does that go over with your, with your peers? I mean, how are, what are those discussions like, or are you uh, an outsider and, you know, because you do things differently? Uh, are you ostracized from here? Because <laughs> Tony and I have had dealings with college coaches and we've been ostracized. In fact, treated quite poorly by some people. In fact, I won't say, I won't go anymore, but uh, how does that go? How, when, when someone asks you, how are you doing this? And you tell them, what's their response? In the college realm, I have had very few people really talk to me uh, asking me what I'm doing here. Um, very few colleges do what I do. I can't, maybe, maybe a couple other colleges are kind of doing a little bit of that feed the cats, you know, minimum dosage style work, um, you know, you know, short to long type of build. But to be honest with you, Chris, I haven't had many other colleges really like pick apart what I do. I don't know if it's when you get into the college scene, everybody likes to try to hold a little bit tighter on what they do. And they preach this, this, and this. Um, I haven't had any I haven't really had much, you know, conflict, I guess, with the college coaching scene. Maybe they just leave me alone, you know, and uh, I guess, you know, it's, it's, um, it's really, I really don't have any, you know, kind of crazy stories for you there, I suppose. Um, they leave me be, I, I, I preach, you know, I, I tweet all the time about what we do with fly work, wicket work, you know, minimum dosage training. Um, and, you know, maybe it's because we've had some really solid success who's gonna, who's, especially in that 400 world, right? I mean, I've had, I've had guys run 46, you know, doing feed the cat style work. We are, even when that grad, that guy graduated just this past indoor season, uh, I had two incoming freshmen, uh, a junior, and then a four, eight style guy on our four by four. And we were number three in the country. We ran 316 on an indoor flat 200 meter track doing feed the cats, minimum dose style work with with two newbies, a senior and a four, eight style kid. Uh, I guess if they want to question it, I mean, for me, it's been working. So I guess all I have to just say is, I guess we'll see on Saturday. And I don't know. I mean, it's, it's just fun to see that the actual, at least for me, the measurables are, are also there. So having this training style and then seeing the measurables, maybe people are leaving me alone because what are they going to relatively say to the results that we're getting? You know, the measurables are, are there and you, you just can't argue with them. But the thing you mentioned earlier is, is unmeasurable, but it's the most important. And I say that, that once you as a coach walk into a track practice and, and you see enthusiasm, even for like a hard workout, I mean, those lactate workouts, I think my guys love them because- Same because they get the next day off or they know that it's not daily and they know 
that that every other team works harder than we do. And it's, it's like, okay, it's time that we man up now. We're going to man up, coach. And that enthusiasm from a team makes you a better coach, doesn't it? It's, it's, you, you, nailed it, you nailed it on the head. It's crazy to see that when you almost, you know, do less of this lactic work or this crazy volume, they almost cherish it more. They get excited to compete that day. You know, four by four predictor. They, our, our, our guys and girls love it. You know, they, they look around and go, she can do it, I can do it. Well, if he can do it, I can do it. And you get a little competition doing a lactic war zone style workout. And you, you don't have to, you know, run these athletes into the ground in order to get that stimulus, get that response, you know, Hey, you know, pump the well a few times when the water's running, leave it alone. You know, it's, it's good to go. Um, it's less is more for me, you know, always. And, and I, even at the beginning of beginning of practice, I'll, I'll say, Hey, you know, scale of one to five, how do we feel today? Um, I try not to be this crazy cookie cutter, you know, architect style coach because we're not training robots you know you gotta I Tony you might have you know talked about this earlier that there's you know being a gardener style coach where you're just simply giving them all of the essentials that they need and then letting that athlete develop grow learn experience those are the things that you want to give that athlete an opportunity to do so you know I don't I don't have a week 11 this is our plan you know we're doing x y z to a t and no matter what we're following that you know, hard and true. Um, I just don't, I don't play it that way. Um, I almost try to just make sure we hit a relatively the same, you know, five fundamental concepts, four fundamental concepts, do it once a week. And once again, I, being a division three level coach, only I feel helps me get those athletes that develop and grow. And they look at me and go, well, coach, whatever you feel we need to do in order to get me to that next level. They almost trust that system, that process more because they almost get to be a little bit of the artists themselves. And I just simply give them the canvas and the tools to paint. So let, let them build their own house. This yeah. You can let them build their own house. It's the old chop wood, carry water thing, yeah. man. As soon as, as soon as kids feel like they have a hand in it, all of a sudden they have, they develop a personality with you and, and they start becoming students of their yeah. sport. And it's, yeah, it's just win, win, win. Well, they trust you, you know, like, and they trust you because it also shows that you're not trying to be this high and mighty, you know, my word is gospel and you do what I tell you to. There's, I always like to tell them, Hey, I'm working with you to get you into that next level. You know, I'm not trying to say this is the end all be all way. Um, and I think honestly, you know, take, like you just said, take the measurables out, take the specific style workouts out and the fundamental idea of a feed the cats program simply makes that culture, that brand, that environment more fun, inviting. Um, you get to chase that measurable and you get to focus on you. And it's not, once again, I, I'm not a volume guy. It's not this mindless running. And then you just say, just trust me, you'll be in shape by the time that we get to the season. I mean, I tell them all the time, like, I don't care how in a 200 and a 400, I don't care how in shape you are. I care how fast you finish through the line. You know, I want to make sure that we work on what's most important first so specificity is is in, is very valuable for us and and that's why i do work a short to long style concept where chris to give you you know i guess that college scene 99.9 percent .9 of college coaches will work long to then short i i just respectfully disagree it just is it's not what i do it's not it's not even enjoyable flat out for that athlete just to be completely honest with you so another thing about your programs, um, about your program, you know, I've only known you from the two, but uh, I know I have kids that go to college and, you know, especially bigger schools, and it's not the high school experience where you're a team and you do things together, but I know that you build that. And that's one of the many reasons why kids come to you. So how do you build that culture in a college setting where the schedule, everyone doesn't get out of school at three o'clock and you know what I mean? You, you don't have the set schedule that we have. Yeah. You know, I guess for starters in the recruiting world, for me, I always, when I, when I talk to each individual athlete, when I recruit them, I make sure that I give them immediate value right off the get. I'll talk to them about not what they are, but what they can become if they decide to choose to, to compete for us. 
Um, that's the first one. I think the moment that you kind of set a tone for them of saying, look what you can become here within this training model, this program, this is where you fit within the team. This is where you can grow, develop, and then speak with these athletes on our team. It, it gives a vision. I love to give them a vision and, and not only as an individual, but then I'm blessed to be able to have a unique position or opportunity to say, hey, your PRs, those per individual goals that you've always wanted can be achieved as a byproduct because you're trying to compete for more than just your PR, but to get into finals, to score points at conference, to score points at nationals, to get into nationals. Um, and then that PR just becomes a byproduct of that. And so I sell that team dynamic because that's what track and field truly needs right off the get. Try to build even if you don't have the facilities to be able to have a balanced program with throws and jumps and sprints and yada, 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 at least control what you can within your facilities. This goes for high school and college and find that team dynamic that you can at least fit. If it's at more of a microscopic level and you really can say, Hey, I only got X, Y, Z for facilities and training and coaching at least then say, I'm going to build the, de the best dang, you know, distance program I can build as a team, the best sprints program I can build as a team best throws program, whatever that is. Um, and so for me, I'm blessed with the ability to have an indoor facility, an indoor football field. Uh, we got two outdoor tracks, two nine lane outdoor tracks. Um, so I can build a, a broader brand um, and say, if you come here, you're going to be a part of something bigger than just yourself. So that's probably the, the number one thing, whether I was at Benedictine, whether I was at Stritch uh, and where I'm at now. And those are three different schools that had totally different facility levels. Um, find your, find your avenue on where you can, you know, really build at least some type of culture or identity, even at the high school scene. So, um, and if it has to be event specific, of course, you know, do what you can with the tools that you, you have available. Um, but when you get into that college scene, I guess your other question was, you know, you, you, as high school, you know, coaches, you know, those students get out at, you know, you know, 3 PM or what have you, and they go through every day. Um, we relatively are kind of the same, at least here, Chris. I mean, we get done with, with class relatively at like 250. We'll fit that, that, that schedule, that plan. Um, and so it's, it's not terribly different for us here, I guess, from a scheduling perspective. Um, so hopefully I at least kind of answered your question on the college scene of how at least I relatively try to build that team dynamic. Um, and, and it can trickle down into the high school scene too, of course, 1000%. Um, I don't think it's by accident that, let's take Illinois, for example, that there's traditional, you know, powerhouse style track and field programs across the entire state. And they usually stay the same because they got a good thing going for them. They preach the, the right things to these athletes to go out for track and stay consistent, stay constant. And that can go for schools that have no indoor track, uh, have a cruddy little outdoor track, whether it's 500 kids in the school or it's 5,000 kids in the school. So you can, within your realm, build that, that base of a, of a, of a total team concept. So Hopefully that kind of answers your question. I probably rambled there. Yeah. But whenever I've talked to uh, big time uh, sprint coaches, Big Ten, blah, 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 if you ask them, are you high volume or low volume, they will all say low volume. Every mm -hmm. single one of them. You know, and but then when I actually see and I have athletes report back to me, their workouts, they are literally all the same. They lift really heavy. They feel like they need a huge base of lifting. I mean, like even more lifting than I would subscribe, subscribe to if I was a football coach. From September, October, November, December, they are just pounding heavy squats, bench, um, Olympic lifts, blah, blah, blah. And then they are doing zero time sprints. They are doing massive numbers of 200s and 300s. They're, they're doing uh, pre-workout runs and post-workout runs. And these are the people that call themselves low volume. So, so explain to our audience what you do in that foundational time when the conve conventional wisdom from everyone is to get really strong mm -hmm. and really in shape and you wait to get fast late. So I'll be honest with you. I don't really have a foundational period. Um, I don't have a, you know, heavy, you know, lifting regiment with the long, 
you know, long runs or 10, 200s or is it crazy to, for me to tell you that every time that we run, we spike up. I don't think I have had a longer workout than 900 total meters, three, three hundreds. And they hate that day They everybody says it's far too long. And I'm like, well, it's, you know, it's not like you want me to be honest with you, go to another program that says we're low volume and they'll, they'll, they'll crank out the 10 by 200 immediately. You know, um, anytime that we honestly lift, it's more of a contrast style lift. I mean, I'll say, Hey, I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to have uh, bars and, and bumper plates upstairs in our, our indoor field house. And so I'll say, Hey, we're going to do three by five, hang clean fast, uh, three by five split jerk uh, fast. And on the in-between you're going to do three by, you know, 20 meter block starts. And I try to get a little bit of a transfer, try to pick up their boost up their nervous system and jump right into some blocks. Um, I really don't have this long drawn out, you know, undulated periodization model of 16 weeks and then we taper off I don't even know if I believe in relative tapering is that bad for me to say too uh I just it's crazy that you know if there's this true belief in like you put on a bunch of foundational volume at the start and then you slowly take it off of them and then they, they peak at the right time I've I've honestly not really done that I've always tried to just say hey what do we need to work on relative from a skill perspective, or I'll say, hey, how do we feel today to see if we can really crank out a solid workout? Um, whether it's lactic or it's top end speed, max velocity, I let that at the athletes relatively tell me when it's their time, if they feel fresh and ready to go. Um, and then how about this, in division three track and field, you can qualify at any given week throughout the, the regular season, four nationals and four conference. And I've had athletes that have had a, an amazing mark their second week and then it's been you know up and down and but by the time that you get to that conference championship or national ch championship level opportunity they usually pr just because the lights are bigger it's a bigger environment it if you how how unfortunate would, would it be for me to actually tell everybody hey we're gonna put a lot of foundational work on high volume and we're gonna have this tapering concept where the first like six weeks don't really like don't expect to run fast, you know, don't expect to jump as far as quote possible. It has been, you look at the data on, on TFERS, which is the college re results reporting systems. All the time you see top end jumps every week, top end sprint times every week, and it goes up and down and all around. So I don't feel like, at least for me here, no, I don't have this long volume styled foundation. I don't lift long and heavy. I don't, I, if anything, I follow Cal's triphasic model relatively from a lifting perspective, I'll keep things very, very, you know, intention based. And we build off of that. I mean, I guess, will I add a little bit of volume to maybe our lactic days later on in the season and then kind of sure, you know, shut it down. Um, once we get to championships, I, I guess. Um, but I, I don't really see this hard concrete causation that you build a foundation and you're just going to buy happenstance, just run faster when it matters most relative to focusing on what that athlete needs for that given week. I really like to try to live week to week to week to week, not always this 12 week layout. It sounds like robots. how you, it, would you say that even in your preseason that you want your kids coming to practice in a performance type of mindset? One thousand. want to be really good at practice. We're not going to do all this stuff no, we, we, we're going to expect you to come out and bring it. Yeah. Execute. Like you're either trying to compete within practice or you're trying to execute in practice. Like that's what we want to try to focus on. Track and field is all right. Let's just take sprinting, for example, even jumping. It's a relatively simple task, but it's so complex. And you're always racing against the last week's version of yourself. Of course, there's other people in your, in your lanes or whatnot, but you're trying to execute a better version of last week's version. And so going in and building, in my opinion, this like lackluster style, mundane volume based type of training style and program only to tell them that don't, Hey, when it, when it comes down to it, we'll get you quote ready. Like I want to, I want to train and prepare and be ready to go now. And then where people will tell me, well, maybe you're, are you, are you doing things too fast too soon? I'll say, well, we take days off. We take Wednesdays off this fall. Like we always make sure that we're recovered well enough to get after the next day. So I guess I try never to be mundane or boring within practices. Um, 
And we ran great at our team trials uh, in, in December, you know, the second week of December before finals, we had the team get out there and get after it. And once again, it was nice to see that they were prepared. Uh, even, even before COVID, I've always loved having December meets for us because that's honestly when we can really tee off. You put 12 weeks of fall training in, well, not that long, but roughly about six to weeks, seven weeks of training in the fall, showcase that right before Christmas break. And boom, you got kids blowing up. And then they have a, founda a foundation or a structure of saying, you can be light, fresh, reactive, explosive, execute your race and learn to be a better athlete of course but then learn to be a technician within your event too so hope that kind of answers your question you know sure. in a long roundabout way but that's how we go about it here we just compete have fun and i try not to make things too detailed I, can i be honest you know both of you guys are you know who i really like to follow listen to and build and, and i'm you know you can it's i think it's so funny you know and, and if, if there is this like higher level of coaching acumen you need to be a college coach then i must have missed it you know the two guys that i listen to the most are a chemistry teacher and a guy who a crazy guy who works is you know athletes out in his basement you know like you guys are the ones that i follow so i'm i just think it's funny that when you you get into that college level scene i don't think that there's got to be this next level of like coaching you know planning training at least not in my world so um i'm, I'm probably even a boring interviewee i just follow what you guys do <laughs> well we've been 30 35 minutes into this and we haven't talked about jumping yet no, we so <laughs> i should turn it over to rob assisi who is the jumps coach at homewood flossmoor and a phenomenal jumps coach and everywhere i've been i've had great jumps coaches dale casey at montini uh tom clancy at york um so i i don't know any technique stuff <laughs> It's all I, good. I just know there's a thing called a penunculum. I don't can't even say it. Some kind of peace step. Um, kind of, yeah, the, the pendulum step. The, the yeah, that, that thing. In fact, today Tony posted something and Dan Fichter texted me. He goes, hey, that's my drill from 20 years ago when I was working with Vika. And I said, well, that may be. I, but I don't think he was around 20 years ago to steal oh, your stuff. I, anyway. I, I steal everything. I don't have, I, like... Oh, he's he's everything. If somebody says, hey, I've seen that drill. This guy doesn't know shit. I'll be like, yeah, I took it from you. <laughs> like, you know, I, I never try to say that I'm the, this, this great inventor of, of training. You know, I mean, should I asterisk everything that I say with, hey, I beg, borrowed and steal, stole this from someone else? Uh, you know, it's funny because Dan's a really good jumps coach, too. It's just everyone forgets that he's a jumps coach. I mean, that's he's had some really good success. But my question isn't so much about technique, but merging this football. And you made a, some really good points about football players. But why do you think, and I guess I might catch crap for this, the best football players in the NFL were all jumpers, whether it's Richard Sherman, um, you know. Julio Jones. Julio Jones. Uh, DK? Oh, Matt Cap, did he jump? The guy, the guy, the cornerback from the Jags, and now he's with the Rams. Oh, uh, Jalen, a Ramsey. Well, in, in tracking football in, in our podcast, I actually said that people assume that the 100 meters is the key event for receivers, mm -hmm. and it's not. It is the key event for running backs, but yeah. for receivers, they were like all jumpers. Yeah, it, I guess to, to go to that original question, you know, from a jumping perspective with, you know, football players, I guess it just shows natural reactive ability. It shows rhythm. It shows timing. It shows targeting. It shows, it, it shows more like you, when you are a jumper, you not only have to work on the speed component of things um, you're working on once again, that rhythm, that timing, that, that, uh, that aerial awareness uh, you know, what else can I say about the jumps and other than like, you have so many things that you have to try to accomplish in such a short amount of time. And in a short distance and a lot's happening, your best athletes can turn it off and just say, go jump, of course. So I, I guess that kind of answers, hopefully that answers your question on why you see a lot of great, you know, skill-based football players as jumpers previously. Do you get any football players from, uh, from Oshkosh coming up? Yeah. Oh, we got probably almost a dozen. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate to have a, a football, head football coach 
uh, Pat Cerrone is great. Uh, their, their staff, you know, they basically tell me, Hey, if our football guys can make your track team, like that actually makes us happy that we know that we got ourselves an athlete on our hands. Um, and so they'll, they'll say, Hey, if you, if you want to do a sport here uh, and, and coach K lets you, lets you go on the team, do it. Yeah. Um, so we do, we have um, our, we had a freshman 60 meter runner, um, Jalen Grant. So he was a football player slash 60 runner for us. Uh, third fastest time in the country for, for D3. He ran a 681. Um, yeah, he, he got down there as a freshman. Now he's a quick kid. Um, we have an All-American pole vaulter that's also a strong safety, believe it or not. So, so Eli's a, uh, he was a 15-3 kid in high school, got up to about 16 feet his freshman year before COVID hit. But um, yeah, he's a, he's a football guy, strong safety for us. Uh, got a couple 400 meter runners in there too. A um, couple throwers as well. So we, we, yeah, we're, we're pretty fortunate to have that dual sport, you know, concept and our coaches are more than supportive of letting those guys, you know, you know, dual sport. I think that's one of the toughest things about getting football players out for track is that track doesn't lie. And so the year I was at Downers North, we had a, a big 10 quarterback, you know, athlete that recruitment is an athlete. He got last place at the 55 at the Proviso West invite. And he quit after that because he didn't want to be exposed. Mm -hmm. And then when I was at Montini, I never got any football guy. I got one, two football guys at York and they both were all state running backs and that was it. But at Montini, I had a number of kids who would come out and they weren't as fast as some other kids and they quit because they were being exposed that they didn't run you know, a six, six or a six, five, 55 and college coaches are wise enough to the fact that they know 55 times, they know 60 times and kids are terrified that the truth will come out that they don't get the coaches handheld 40, but an FAT time. I so was that style of kid in high school. I mean, it's scary. It's scary to put yourself out. It's always easy to, to hide behind. I'm football fast, you know, look at my tape, you know, look at, look what I can do here. Uh, but when you really got to put that thing down in front of, you know, uh, you know, fans, spectators, and then a legitimate measurable time comes out. Yeah. No one wants to look slow. Yeah. I, I got a question from Rob. He's bailing me out here. Do you have any suggestions for athletes who have difficulty toggling between single arm action for the long jump and double arm action for the TJ or HJ? They may take the double arm action to LJ. I, Ben Young, Downers Grove South kid. I think he's like one of the only guys I've actually even relatively seen that double arms his long jumps. Uh, it's how he organizes task. I, I, I can't say that it's wrong to do that or right to do that, but it's just, it, it relatively works for him. I try not to be such a, you know, a, a, a you know, detailed sculptor of train of technique and jumping. And, and I let, I let that athlete relatively kind of figure out how their, their body operates hitting a penultimate position, you know, getting in the air, their, their air mechanics. So, um, I got this question before with like single arm to double arm concepts and in, in the triple jump, I guess, once again, it kind of goes back to what's feels more natural for, for that jumper. Um, I guess I, I kind of preached it in the video, I suppose, you know, if, you, if you're the farther jumper you are, I guess the more comfortable I am, as, let's take the triple jump and you being a double arm triple jumper, uh, you get more time in the air to, to set up your position, get both arms behind you from getting to that H to Y position, be able to hit the, hit the ground and obviously then be able to propel yourself relatively into that next jump or keep your speed. So um, I actually have had athletes go from being single arm triple jumpers trying double it looked terrible we couldn't figure it out we gave it a good honest effort and try with a few meets halfway through the season and it just wasn't clicking for them we ironically went back to single and then they ended up PRing by a foot and a half and maybe that was just them understanding that they're more of a single arm triple jumper than they are double and I got to put my hand up in the air and say my bad you know like I I'm trying to find the best way to get you to jump farther and I think it's important to let that athlete find that for themselves too. Um, but yeah, uh, hopefully that kind of answers your question, at least from a single to a double arm concept. It's almost relatively that athletes, 
foundation that they've kind of built for themselves over the their years of organizing athletic movement themselves. So that's the best answer I got. And taking your, your jump training back to the football stuff, I can't help but watching the, the drills and stuff that you do for jumpers and thinking that should not just be for jumpers. Your X factor stuff, Tony, is pretty much jumps concepts alone. It, it's, yeah. it's so funny that it blends in so well. It, it's, it, it really is that lens of, I almost would say if I was a high school coach, get your sprinters to, to go jump a few times, even in, in a meet, you know, relatively give them a couple opportunities to get their approach down. So they feel relatively comfortable, but on your off days of sprinting, they're doing so much plyometric work, so much jumps, drills esque style concepts, get them in the pit. You know, I mean, I brought this up in my, in my, um, in my video that, Hey, if you want to keep that athlete out, that got quote exposed in the sprinting, you know, nobody wants to be the 11th fastest guy in the fly 10 on their team. So ironically though, like, because the jumps is its own relative craft, even though it's very close knit, you can be that eighth best fly time guy and still be the number two or three long jumper. So then you find your fit within your, your, your team, your dynamic and your event group. So I hope that, you know, kind of answers your question there, but yeah, your X factor stuff, half of that battle is already done as a jumper. I, I was going to circle back to something else too. You know, when we're talking about the high volume fall, you know, like medium volume winter, you know, like, and then, you know, long to short, you know, of course, so much of that came from the legend Clyde Hart. And, and, you know, the word is that he, he had to keep Michael Johnson healthy. And so the, I think one of the things that, I have to answer to all the time is that when you're dealing with good athletes and you're asking them to come with a performance mindset all the time, mm -hmm. that they're all going to get hurt. I have found that they don't, that, that, that they don't get hurt and they might get hurt more by doing heavy squats and lots of volume. Do you have a healthy team? Yeah. Uh, we don't have a lot of chronic issues. You know, I don't get shin splints. Really. I don't see our athletes coming through and saying, ah, oh, coach, I can't even get through this workout that you're going to get me. My shins are killing me. I mean, yeah, there might be a couple of scenarios here and there. If anything, I'll get, you know, the, the, the hamstring issue, but I mean, my goodness, where do you not see that across any sport relatively? So, you know, a lot of times it's, it's more about um, making sure that they're, healthy and fresh to do what you're asking them to do. Remember, if you're going to have high intensity and a high intentional day, you can't do it a million times over and over. Like it might be, let's say we're doing fly twenties. We might get like three of them in and then we go home. It's crazy for me to realize like, you know, going in back now, we get a dynamic warm up in. If we're doing an MV day, Tony, it's a dynamic warm up. We don't jog around the track. We get our dynamic in, we get ready to go to run fast. We probably get about two, maybe three fly twenties. And then we go home. That's one of our days, you know, hey, so guys don't get chronic injuries with that type of training. You know, I, I see, you know, our girls program at Plainfield North has never been feed the cats. They're, they're a lap based program. Mm -hmm. they, they run laps constantly. And, uh, and I just see bags of ice on their shins after practice every day. And I've never seen ice on one of my guys ever. No, we just don't get shin problems. We don't get that chronic usage, you know, style of injury. And I think a lot of that obviously has to do with, it should be showing you that you're, you're training for the right, you know, events essentially too. Like if you're in the sprints and jumps world, we shouldn't be getting chronic level or style of injuries because what we're doing isn't a long continuous style event you know so why should we be seeing those styles of injuries you know there's got to be a little bit of a correlation behind that i would hope Tony, i gotta ask did you get a dog i see a dog trotting back and forth <laughs> we're uh we're babysitting my daughter's corgi 
uh, dog sitting for the last week because they had to go down to their in-laws. She had to go to her in-laws in Cincinnati and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I have a corgi in the house right now, but it's not mine. How's, how is the corgi? Um, it was neurotic for a couple of days, but it's <laughs> it, it now feels like it's home. Supposedly, they're the toughest dogs on the planet. It might be. I think he'd, he'd tear up both of your boar bells. <laughs> <laughs> I just see him trotting back and forth, so I had to ask. Um, I was going to mention, uh, Justin, the uh, Bush X Nader made a, a cool comment uh, that 75% of all NCAA football players, in his opinion, failed to reach their genetic ceilings. And that's like stuck in my mind for a long time because I think the percentage is pretty damn high in college track of kids that never get to their genetic ceiling. I, I mean, I hope they do at your place, but don't you think that's probably true? Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I, I was listening to that podcast from a football sense. And I guess the, what I was really gathering from that was, you know, they're essentially just stuck on some old ways and style of training that might not be that beneficial to building a quote, better athlete, getting that true, you know, like you said, genetic potential, um, you know, out of that, that football player or even here for track. Yeah. Um, some, some of that has to deal with just coaches, you know, sticking to the same old ways that they do things and they want to have a, uh, a simple in task style of training plan and a cookie cutter fit. Um, and I think that, yeah, you'd probably be right. Even in a college track world, you see a lot of athletes just fitting the bill of what's needed for that athlete to be great on that specific team for that specific year and that specific event with these specific marks. So um, we might be putting a, a lid on it as track coaches too. Um, I hope I try not to. And I feel like the best way for me to do that is to try and work once again with that athlete to find out within the realm of coaching a track team, how I can give them the best individual benefit to get them individually better within this umbrella. I'm not a, I'm not a hardcore style. We do this, 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 this. It, it's honestly, I feel the best way to untap their genetic potential, allow them to build as they develop and grow. And once again, Tony, I got developmental level kids. You know, I don't have the polished kid. Um, not, not a lot. So we have to explore. And I think that helps that genetic potential come to fruition. So with that in mind, what are three things you want a jumper to be able to do technically when they show up at your door? When they show up at my door, technically? Yeah. What would you like to see three technique, three things that a jumper can do technically day one, August 15th? Oh, um, man. Give me my workout close. I guess, what would I want to see? Because yeah. it never happens. Um, you know, hey, are, you know, I, what I want to see is an athlete that's not going to, um, you know, have a, I feel like you can relatively teach an athlete how to enter into the sand correctly. Uh, you can, you can drill some of those basic little, you know, leg shoot positions and really teach them how to actually enter in the sand correctly. I feel like that's the same concept of if you're playing basketball, if you're still, if, if you're a basketball coach and you see a kid shooting with two hands, and even if they're good at making it with two hands, you got to teach them technically how to shoot properly with an actual like shooting hand and a guide hand, you know, um, entry, like what I would want to see, but funny enough with the entry, I feel like I probably, um, see a lot of these athletes PR by like six inches immediately because we hammer proper entry technique and just by design they get a little bit they get farther because they're jumping correctly or at least entering excuse me into the sand correctly um what technically would i also like to see um a, a flat foot concept on your last two steps technically I, i'd like to see that athlete hit a good penultimate to plant position you know not a not a toe jumper that they're just sprinting off the board and then they're just nose diving and over rotating. So I would say it would be nice to see, you know, that athlete be able to hit a penultimate position. Um, but once again, that's few and far between. Um, a third one, uh, their mark, having a relative mark that's not 150 feet back. I'd almost rather like to see that athlete that starts in that 80 
75 up to at most 100 feet and can get that approach down like rhythm and timing, their target, their, their, their position. You know, I would say that if they can be technically or comfortably sound on the approach, that would help tremendously with them hitting positions every single time that they jump. So those are probably my three. Do I ever get that? Um, yeah, I guess I do. I mean, if they come from a jumps program where they are on point, yeah, absolutely. But usually hitting a, a triple threat with that. No, not usually. Um, but that's what's honestly fun. When I watch a, an athlete, a girl or a guy just naturally bounce out an amazing jump. And I look at it and I go, you have no idea how good you could actually be in this. Um, ironically, the first thing we work on is though, top end speed. You know, if you are you can't run, you know, all out on the runway. You can't be, if you're, if you're Mac, if your MV is at 20 miles per hour, you know, you're going to be at relatively 18 and a half to 19 miles per hour, you know, going through that board to make sure that you're at least at a controlled chaos. Um, if I can say that then your top end, we can get you to 22 miles per hour and train that. And now we drop to that 20, what you previously were in an all out effort of purely sprinting, you about, you fixed probably about three or four problems right off the get. And you see that a lot in pole vault too. It's unreal how many things that you'll fix when that athlete just simply gets faster. Same thing in triple and same thing, of course, in long jump, high jump as well. You, you slow those things down. So anyway, that's, those are the three. Yeah. I just heard a pole vault coach today um, from England say that uh, one of the biggest myths in pole vaulting is that max speed is important. Um, he said, because because you're never at max speed you need to learn how to run with controlled speed and i just kind of shook my head like like i i still think that i would max speed train my vaulters i, I we do all the time we fly our we fly our vault crew every week um they just do it on their off days um i guess i understand what he's saying in a relative concept that no you're not going to be running at max velocity and tension on the runway but imagine if you get two miles per hour faster and then your controlled run is now at your previous MV. You just, you just actually fixed three of your problems you had and you got yourself three new problems because now we got to go up on a bigger pole. <laughs> like, so that's a good, those are three more good problems to have. You got rid of these, you just picked up these. I, I've got to get this question in. You've been a jumps guy. Um, put on your sprinter's hat and give us your favorite plyos for sprinting. Same with jumping. <laughs> that, so you would have no, like I've heard, you know, like Joe Smith talk about, um, you know, the short, the long ground contact times uh, are not great for sprinting. And it's made me question, well, maybe I'm doing too many of those, but those are my, my strength builders. Um, we do both the long ground, ground contact, the short ground contact. Um, we do the hops, but we also do the long things. So you wouldn't, you think all jump training is pretty damn good for sprinting. Yeah. 1000%. I, hey, I don't claim to, to be a master in the, in the biomechanics of things. I, I leave that up to, to Chris. Um, you know, I, I honestly look at in the lens of as long as you're providing, you know, the right style of, of plyometrics in, in terms of ground contact times or from a speed-based component, from a strength-based component, from, um, you know, an, an eccentric, isometric, concentric style of loading within plyos, those correlate both sides. They, I mean, I want to try to build the best overall athlete that I can. And I feel like, are there some things that I guess I could say that are not as high of priority as another type of plyo? Sure. Um, but at the same time, like you're putting them in different levels of stimulus and they're learning and adapting, evolving and growing from what, from those levels that you're giving them. So I feel like you're, you're on the right pathway. I, I love adding variables to our training. I love to see athletes try to solve puzzles, physical puzzles, organizing tasks differently. That's, that's the best way I can at least explain it on my end. Plyos are relatively the same across the board. Chris, what are your favorite plyos? Changes. <laughs> changes? Yeah, I, changes. Sometimes I don't do them at all for a long period of time. Um, 
after I got the 1080 release mechanism, I started doing a lot of speed bounds and I really liked that a lot. I saw a lot of carryover. Um, I would disagree with what Joel said. Uh, I've been working on some things. People have been, there's been a guy, Steve Jones has got a video guy who's been overlaying athletes uh, on a video and I've been going through and his fastest guy is on the ground the longest and there's a really good reason why. Um, so, and, and, and Bolt was on the ground longer than other people. And I think that has a lot to do with how far that shin travels and how much you're loading that, that whole foot complex. Um, so I, I went for a really long time with not doing any plyos for about 15 years. <laughs> um, I just started going back to them this year because of that thing on the 1080. Um, but other than that, that's it. I was going to tell you that your shin angle drills and exercises, you know, I, I actually, um, was talking with with one of my athletes. I was talking with Benny about those um, that shin dropping that shin and learning to hit a different angle. Um, we we have that we we use a, a relative band and we hold them back and they simply just drop that shin and learn to press out of that angle and and step into the next position. You know we're not perfect on it. That's kind of a hard drill to teach them so they don't feel like they're just trying to tug somebody. If you know yeah. what drill I'm talking about, it's just a single step. You know position. You drop that front shin and you you let that knee almost touch the ground and then you learn to project in that angle. Um, that's Tony, probably what I've really been liking to discover, explore more with a lot of my, a lot of my athletes. Um, I've been getting up against a rail a wall partner bands. We've really been working on shin angle, to be honest with you. That's a big one for us right now. That's what I've spent half our workouts doing. And, and when this video, I think I'm going to use it for whenever our next TFC is Tony, and I are going to have breakfast soon and figure that out what we're doing next, but I think I'm going to save it for that. But there's been some really interesting things uh, when they're overlaying these people on top of each other from different angles. And it's, it's been really pretty cool. Well, Justin, we're definitely going to have to have you back because uh, you're fun to talk to. It's, it's, I, I get tired of, <laughs> we've had a couple of athletes that Chris and I have worked with. They were like state champion type people. And they go to school and, and we have to tell them not to say they, you know, not to ever mention like feed the cats or core fist or holler uh. because they will literally, I'm telling you, there's one guy and you know him, um, state champion. We're talking a real fast hundred meter guy uh -huh. goes in and says, he asked him how he was trained. He said, basically, you know, I trained with feed the cats principles. We, we ran fast a lot. And he goes, well, that doesn't work at the college level. I'm not big fans of Holler and Corfist. Says this to a freshman in his, uh -huh. in his interview the first day he's in with the program. You know, let alone, you know, like we have a guy that was a, a 24 plus long jumper that, that went to Notre Dame. And he was ridiculed by the, because of the way he had trained to get to 24 something in the long jump. And and so it's refreshing for us to hear that uh, that the kids won't be ridiculed for knowing us. I, I, I will say this. If all of the college level coaches want to, you know, look at feed the cats as however they want to view it and don't want to install it into their own training, fine by me. I mean, I'm, you know, my, my goal is to, to take advantage of every opportunity that I can with what you guys provide. And, um, yeah, of course, at the end of the day, you know, if you have simply a good athlete, they're going to be able to showcase their athletic ability, whether you're not, you, you go Clyde hard, you do feed the cat style work. If you have them stand on their head for an hour, I mean, some athletes are just flat out good. I think Tony, for you, what I, what I would at least preach on my end is I'm not the division one coach. I, I don't get those polished top tier level athletes. I get the, I get the good athlete that needs more time. I get that athlete that has a little bit, um, you know, just a, a hair of experience, and then they get the opportunity to really grow and build and develop here. And ironically, that is why we're one of the best programs in the country for our division. But hey, you can look up TFERS, you can look up our stats, you know, numbers don't lie. I mean, I tell, I tell recruits that all the time, you know, find your fit, find out what your mark is going to mean to you and where it's going to be valued, not only on the team, but at the conference level, at the national level, if you want to be 
a winner, if you want to go and like reach your highest level potential within that conference or national scene, a lot of times that's in the division three world. I, I, I said this to Chris earlier. I mean, people forget that in, in D3, you know, guys are running 10, one, 10, 20 was the national champ. This outdoors past outdoor season in 2019 for the hundred 10, two, Oh, I think if you want to get second or third, you had to run like 10, 25, you know, like people forget there's fast, there's fast dudes, you know, same thing with the ladies, you know, 11 mid, like you got to be able to put down a time. Um, and I guess finally, I'll just say like, when that, when that high school athlete goes into that recruiting process, every, every school has its pros and cons. Every school has, you know, there's no such thing as the perfect school. It's what's perfect for that individual athlete. But I will say this in, in, in my lens, at least with college track and field, you can't hide behind your division anymore. You know, you're measurable as you're measurable. Your time is your time. And what you'll find out in that college level scene is colleges will look at each individual, you know, measurable and say, Hey, you qualify for these marks, not by your division, but by your measurable. And so that's where I always love to preach and teach division three. I, of course I'm subjective. I was a D three athlete, you know, I'm coaching at a division three institution, but I, I, I love this conference, the Wisconsin athletic conference. Oh my goodness. You want to, you want to be a part of some really good track. You don't have to look any further than, than right here. It's unbelievable. When I was at York, we sent more kids to that conference just because of the comp how competitive it was and how much it mimicked their high school experience compared to kids that went to run at Big Ten. And they said, literally said, I'd show up at practice. There's a workout on the wall. And because we all had class at different times, I'd go out and do the workout myself. And so it's, it wasn't anything like it. And a lot of those kids quit. You know, they said, this just, it just sucks. It's not fun. Yeah, I think uh, the best track book I ever read was uh, Mark Guthrie's book. Yeah. Uh, Where did he coach? Whitewater? Uh, wasn't it lacrosse? I believe it was lacrosse. Oh, I think it was lacrosse. But yeah, just outstanding coaches, great conference, good stuff. Yeah. Hey, you know, it's, it's so fun to be a part of this conference because talk about the tradition, the, the, the level of athletic you know, potential that these athletes can achieve. It's, it's so fun. I'm so blessed to be a part of this conference. And it's, it's just great to go to these level of championships for us. And we can look around and once again, no, no quarrels with other divisions or other institutions, but it is fun to watch our conference performance list and be able to say, Hey, what does the other conference performance list look like across the country and all other divisions and um, Google it. You'll find out. Nothing like a good old fashioned Googling. <laughs> hey, it's great talking to you guys today. And it's been a great podcast. Can't wait to rewatch it tomorrow. You betcha. Good night. All righty. We'll see yeah, you. Good night, everyone. You bet. Bye-bye. See you.